Hello and welcome to Long Beach Lens. I'm your host, Derek J. Simpson, Executive Director of the Long Beach Community Action Partnership. Recently, there were several hundred people at a Long Beach City Council meeting to voice concerns for renter protections. As high-rise buildings go up downtown Long Beach, high rents continue to increase across the city as well. It's one thing to say that millennials can't afford to buy a home anymore in our city. It's quite another to consider that a single parent with two children may have to move because their complex was sold and the new owner wants to increase rent by a total of $600 per month within eight months. Maybe that parent could move and uproot their children from their school or accept a place in a less desirable area. However, a retired senior citizen might not have such flexibility in that same complex. What are they to do? You will hear some of our fellow Long Beach citizens share their concerns and possible solutions. Affordable housing is a very important matter. They mention the need to diversify housing projects and integrate different socioeconomic levels in new construction. Maybe offer better deals with land developers to encourage affordable housing elements. Again, we are reminded that for millennials, affording a home in Long Beach may soon be a dream deferred. Affordable housing is very important. It provides housing for the much needed community and so I support that very much. I like the gesture the city has made in terms of making investors when they develop housing to have affordable housing as part of the project. But I think that number could be increased to like 45%. We have to diversify the housing projects so they really integrate different levels of people and that will help each level get more compatible with each other. The cost of housing and marketing, it's so astronomical. The average millennial person may not even be able to afford a home. Like big corporations, they had to move out of state. We don't want people moving out of state. So we need to do better use of our land usage, do better deals with investors, and help them get better tax credits so they can add affordable housing to their portfolios. If the affordable housing concerns are not addressed, we're going to have many more homeless people. The homeless people is such a problem, and we have to do something to provide housing for them. It has to be affordable. I would really like to see them have more housing available for the low-income families. That's most important to me. If you don't feel safe in home or neighborhood, if you fear interacting with the police, if you believe that because of the color of your skin, the law is not your friend, public safety is a concern. In this next segment, we hear such sentiments. We also hear mothers speak about conversations with their sons and how they should act, dress, or carry themselves in public to avoid a negative interaction with authorities. Real talk from the hearts of parents that care. Honestly, as a father of a son that has been shot, three granddaughters, and one grandson growing up, now their thoughts truly resonate with me, and I hope they do with you as well. Public safety is a concern because I feel like it's difficult to pursue other avenues of your life, in your life, uh, getting educated, getting a good job, if you don't feel safe or if you're not safe in your neighborhood. Public safety is a concern because a lot of people look at the police officers as bad. They look at, they feel it as a threat. We do have issues that are not necessarily being addressed in all of our communities. I see efforts being made by our city to increase our patrols and the civic engagement of the police with the community. I don't believe that it's done. Until we have zero um, crime, zero deaths, murders, um, it's always going to be a concern. There is an endemic fear, I believe, among people of color and for young boys particularly, 
of a fear of law enforcement. And that is because traditionally those people have been targeted or profiled by law enforcement. The nationwide issues that we've had with law enforcement and, and um, some of our black and brown brothers and sisters losing their lives as a, a part of or in the hands of our law enforcement. I have uh, four grandsons, all of whom are African American and all of whom we've had to tell them, learn how to spread it, do not respond, put your hands on the wheel, don't make any sudden moves, even when they're not doing anything. Being the mother of African American boys, that's where safety becomes a concern. Make sure you're walking with your head up, your hood off, take your headphones out. That's the scariest thing to be able to have to pray over my children as I let them from the house. One of the things, an organization I'm involved in is 100 Black Men of Long Beach. I'm the founder and we teach our youth, uh, ages 8 to 18, how if how and when they're confronted by policemen, how to conduct themselves. And it's proven to be a great success amongst our youth. And it depends sometimes on what the lack of training that has been done with um, police. I think there needs to be some, not only racial healing, but also some, some interpersonal communication. There needs to be some trainings. It's sad to constantly see, you know, our candlelight vigils and having to, seeing mothers and fathers having to put their children to rest as a result of some of this police violence. I don't know the numbers in Long Beach um, as far as, you know, types of brutality, um, but I'm sure they're there. I've heard stories. I can't even imagine being a police woman myself. The tensions are so high, you're dealing with life and death situations. So it's hard for them. Yes, there are some things that do happen in the city, but not every police officer is a bad person. It's the people that don't act right. Those are the ones that create problems for everybody. I'd like to see the city continue to collaborate and bring uh, stakeholders, everybody in the city together to address concerns and keep working on uh, solving those issues. I think to make Long Beach safer, they could have more uh, officers uh, patrol by foot and attend more community meetings with different organizations. They do attend the, uh, the NACP of Long Beach. Uh, there's many others that could attend and attend more often. I would really like to see the city of Long Beach have more time where the police officers are actually patrolling the city, where they're doing things that they can come out and talk to the community. If we bring the city of Long Beach and the police officers together to have conversations, we can get on the same page. Communication is so important. More council meetings where that's open to the public and invite all of the police officers and allow them to just talk. I think what I would do is like to look at the city's plan, look at what the police commission is working with the community and doing. I want folks to be able to go to the police and be able to engage on a personal level and on a professional level if they need without fear or worry that they'll get shot and killed as a standby person and not the actual victim because it's, it's, it's bigger than this. All people need to be engaged because I know that there are some families that have had different stories. I am a person that walks the streets and lives in the community. I work in the community and I really believe it's getting better but there's still things that need to be done. Could I feel safer? Yes. Yes? Yes. Definitely. Yes. Wow. Powerful thoughts that deserve our attention and action as we strive to make our community a safer and more welcoming place for all of us. In this next segment, our co-host Errol Parker and I reflect on the powerful operatic performance of Dr. Darrell Akon. We also reflected on the conversation of Dr. Alex Norman and Ahmed Safir about the African American community at a crossroads. Each of our panels were powerful and I was personally honored to discuss our experience with Errol and hope that our dialogue inspires you to watch all three panel presentations in their totality.
Errol, we started this conversation today about the African-American community at a crossroads with a very creative performance by Darrell Akon. I think that caught people off guard, but it, it was such a powerful performance. What were your thoughts? Well, it set the tone uh, for, for the whole panel discussions. He was, uh, the other day, he was at the African-American Cultural Center uh, presentation, and he did the same thing. He's just, a, we're just blessed to have a talent like that. But if you really listen to the lyrics and the passion of his poem, you can discover a lot about the African-American experience. It was wonderful. Right, and, and the sad part is that, that that experience continues because we heard that through all the panels, yes. that the struggle is real, it's just manifested itself in a different way. And uh, that was something we first heard in the panel dialogue with Ahmed Safir and Dr. Norman. Mm -hmm. What struck you about that conversation? Well, both of those gentlemen made some just some excellent points. And I'm glad we, we've captivated it on, on patented television so people can right. go back. Dr. Norman seemed a little frustrated because of what the hard work that he's done, they're laid out there, and for some reason right. we could not continue. And that has right. to be dissected. But a man of his talents and insight and some others, I think we're going to get back on track with that. We yeah. really must do that. And I think that's that's some ownership we have to take as, a, as an yeah. African-American community because that state of black Long Beach event, we had so much momentum. Yeah. And I think we were victims of our, our own uh, efforts. In, I want to speak to that because I really believe, it's just like, let's use a sports analysy. Jenny Buss owns the Los Angeles Lakers. She, she, she needs a good coach. She needs a new general manager. We have a, and they have, but they have a lot of talent. Mm -hmm. But what the city of Long Beach, an African-American community needs good facilitation. Right. We need to have an empathetic facilitator who understands the casting characters in our community and will be able to move people forward. I mean, the person from the outside that came to California Endowment was good to a point. Right. But you need to understand who we're dealing the with. The dynamics of the people. Absolutely, so they right. can move forward. Because between right. meetings, nothing happens. But you, there's a lot of work between meetings. Right. It's very possible for us, with good facilitation, to move forward. What struck you about your panel, education and employment? That was a great conversation. It was, especially the dialogue between uh, uh, Mr. Tate, uh, Mr. Tate and, and Dr. Yeah. Connolly. Right. I think list, they, they listened to one another. They made right. some excellent points, and we, we've captivated it, but they listened to one another, and it was a good exchange. But I think education is the key, mm -hmm. and then it, the, the, the pot after that is employment. And we really have to make people accountable for that, because if a black man cannot take care of his family, if he not, does not have a good education, then he's going to be at risk. Right. And we really have to avoid that. And we want them to be gainfully employed, not underemployed. Absolutely. And the education contributes to that. Last but not least, we talked about the social determinants of health. Mm -hmm. And we had a strong panel, yes. all African-American women, yes. all in positions of leadership. Yes. I thought it was outstanding. It, it really was. I think there's some, there's some misnomers. There's some... Uh, misunderstandings about public health, and we have to impact that in order for us to, to do some preventative things and to, to be healthy again as a community. Right. Errol, this dialogue was just the beginning. Yes. Our community so. needs to be re-engaged. They're giving me the sign for less than a minute. <laughs> <laughs> we know what that means. That, yes. <laughs> but what would you like to see come from this, Errol? For I'm going to take budget? personal responsibility for that. I, I'm going to use my television program on PadNet and community engagements in the schools and the community to, to, to do that. Well, I'm going to do the same, and we want to thank you for what you're doing on PadNet. Thank I know you that for... you've been determined to make your show come back. You helped and, me do that. And through that determination, you've made it happen, and I want, to know how, want you to know how much we appreciate that effort. And, and that's why I wanted you here. I could have done these panels, mm. but I know your commitment to this community and your contribution to what we do in media, and, and I want to thank you for that. It's good to be valued. Thank absolutely, you so much for inviting absolutely. me. Absolutely. Thank you, man. All right. And thanks, everyone else, for watching uh, this very special uh, dialogue that we've had about the African-American community at a crossroads. Harold mentioned taking personal responsibility for next steps. It is our hope that this PadNet presentation inspires you to consider your own responsibility to make our community a safe, respectful, inspiring place to live, learn, and work. Each of us has a value that the world needs to be whole. The color of our skin, our belief systems, or preferences should not determine our future. The contents of our hearts, the wisdom that guides us, and the positive contribution 
that each of us can make, regardless of how we look, should be what's most important, one race, the human race. Thank you for watching. Thank you for joining on today's show. Be sure to follow PadNet on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for the latest updates. We also welcome your comments and thoughts regarding this show as we strive to make Long Beach Lens a favorite source of local news, information, and entertainment. This show has been brought to you with support from the Long Beach Community Action Partnership. Thank you again for watching Long Beach Lens.